telling the truth through imaginative fiction. We are delighted, I've got to say, to welcome Malcolm Geit, educated in Cambridge and Durham, and now chaptain of Girton College, Cambridge. Actually, you don't know this, but we have a connection. Mm. The only time I ever went to Girton when I was a student was to play in a band up there. <laughs> First time Malcolm went to Girton was to play in a band. Yeah. His was jazz, mine was a bit louder, but there we are. A poet, priest, academic, embodying the roles of integration of rigorous thought and imaginative feeling, which is illustrated so powerfully in C.S. Lewis. Malcolm has published on what Christians believe, on poetry, playfulness, and truth and has long-standing interest in Coleridge and in C.S. Lewis, and contributed to the Cambridge Companion on C.S. Lewis. In his major book, Faith, Hope and Poetry, Theology and the Poetic Imagination, he says, referring to Lewis, and I quote, to find a way of making a marriage a fruitful union of the apparent opposition of region, reason and imagination is perhaps the most urgent task of our own time. I give you Dr. Malcolm Geint. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, St. Peter said on the Mount of Transfiguration, "'Tis good, Lord, to be here." It's very good. It's, uh, um, I shouldn't really take St. Peter uh, any further though, because uh, on almost all of those occasions, whenever he opens his mouth, he puts his foot in it. So uh, I shall try not, uh, not to do that. But I hope um, really what I say will be a response to a development, um, further reflection on the very good things that we've just heard uh, Professor McGrath said. He was obviously exploring the various ways in which uh, Lewis appeals to reason in his apologetics, but uh, rightly pointed out to us that that appeal to reason, to what I think Dr. McGrath called reasonableness, is in fact constantly in Lewis interwoven with an appeal to imagination, a series of invitations to look at things in a new way, to imagine how the world might look if Christianity were the case. And I certainly agree with Professor McGrath that in Lewis's mature work, appeals to reason and imagination are simultaneous, complementary, balanced, mutually enfolded. However, in this lecture, I want, if I may briefly, to distinguish from that interwoven uh, thread, the imaginative strand, and to look specifically at the role imagination played, both in Lewis's own journey to faith, his own preparatio evangelica, and in his subsequent apologetic writing. But here, I am going to take apologetics in its very broadest sense, and I am going to include all his fiction and his poetry as part of that great apologia. Uh, so, uh, if we're to understand the, the specific and special role played by the imagination in Lewis' writings post-conversion, then it is essential to understand the very different way in which he configured uh, those two uh, essential powers of the soul, reason and imagination, before his conversion. Uh, what Lewis, in fact, experienced with deepening distress throughout the 1920s of the last century was a profound divorce, a bifurcation between what his reason told him was the case, what he felt he could know and affirm philosophically on the one hand, and the deepest intuitions or apprehensions of his imagination on the other. And uh, uh, Dr. McGrath has already uh, given you, but I will give you again, that extraordinary pair of sentences where he puts it so starkly, looking back after many years uh, in Surprise by Joy, writing about himself in the 20s. The two hemispheres of my mind were in sharpest contrast. On the one side, 
a many-islanded sea of poetry and myth. On the other, a glib and shallow rationalism. Nearly all that I loved, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. Of course, that account of his dilemma was written post-conversion, written many years after the period of his own life that Lewis was describing. However, we have a much more contemporary document. We have a poem in which Lewis explores these same issues, not in retrospect, but while they were still in suspension, while they were still unresolved, while he was living deeply the pain of that dissociation and split in his own mind. Um, the poem was never published in his lifetime. It was published uh, posthumously in Walter Hooper's uh, edited collection, The Collected Poems of Lewis, which came out in 64. And uh, the poem is titled by Hooper, but not by Lewis, is titled Reason. But uh, if Professor McGrath is right in his uh, timings in the new biography, as I think he is, uh, first right in dating this poem, and this amazed me, uh, as early as 1925. There's now a three-way conversation going on between him and, um, and Michael Ward and myself as to what the real dating of this poem is. But uh, if it's as early as 25 or 26, and if Dr. McGrath is right in revising the date of Lewis's conversion to Christianity as opposed to theism uh, to 1931, then what we have in this poem, Reason, which I'm about to read to you, uh, is uh, a poem written five or six years before Lewis became a Christian. A poem in which Lewis lays out the fundamental dilemma, not just for himself, I think, but actually I think for the whole of post-enlightenment culture. I think he was, he was like the bellwether, he was like the canary in the cage. He was sensing a deep trauma in our culture. Um, it's, it's a complete mistake, I think, to think of Lewis as, as a constantly, as it were, backward-looking, deliberately reactionary, ultra-conservative Don who grumbled about the place and thought he was born in the wrong century. Of course, Lewis quite enjoyed feeding that myth himself and loved to refer to himself as the last of the dinosaurs. But actually, he was keenly tuned to the currents of the 20th century and felt deeply in himself um, splits that, uh, that, that we all, if we're honest, recognize as little, little fissures <laughs> running through the structure of our thought. So um, we have a poem which expresses, as he felt it, uh, that deep gulf, and that is a deep gulf over which any effective Christian apologetics will have to throw a bridge. Or to use the metaphor that Lewis uses in the poem, those are the reason and imagination are the estranged powers of our souls which Christianity will have to reconcile. And it seems to me that in this poem, as I said, Lewis is not simply identifying a private dilemma, but feeling something that runs right still, right through our culture, particularly in the scientific West. So uh, the poem offers us an extended metaphor of the soul as a kind of inner Athens, divided between two goddesses, up on the Acropolis, Athene, gazing in pure, clear air at the perfect and precise movement of the heavenly bodies, the light of the stars. But underneath, in the dark kind of wombing caves where the mysteries are enacted, Demeter, the one from whom the fertility of the whole city really springs. So here is Lewis's poem, I think one of the finest things he ever wrote. Um, and I take great pleasure reading it the day before he will be remembered in Poet's Corner. Uh, because as many of you know, Lewis's first and prime ambition for the whole first half of his life was to be a poet. To borrow Keats' phrase, to be numbered among the poets. And it's good that something of that is coming true. So here is this poem, which I think is so crucial for him and for us. Reason. Set on the soul's Acropolis, the reason stands, a virgin armed, commercing with celestial light. And he who sins against her, 
has defiled his own virginity. No cleansing makes his garment white. So clear is reason. But how dark imagining. Warm, dark, obscure and infinite. Daughter of night. Dark is her brow. The beauty of her eyes with sleep is loaded. And her pains are long. And her delight. Tempt not Athene. Wound not in her fertile pains, Demeter, nor rebel against her mother right. Oh, who will reconcile in me both maid and mother, who make in me a concord of the depth and height, who make imagination's dim exploring touch ever report the same as intellectual sight, then could I truly say, and not deceive, then wholly say that I believe. Isn't that an extraordinary poem? It's really remarkable. And um, it's, it's, it's wonderful that it... <laughs> It actually took the poet himself perhaps five years to work out <laughs> the answer to his own question, even though, as I hope to show, it was kind of very much embedded in the poem itself. So, that opening vision of Athene, a virgin armed, clear, who sins against her as deviled his own virginity, it makes it clear that for Lewis then, and I think for Lewis throughout his life, any truth, however inconvenient, must be known and faced for what it is if we have arrived at that truth by a clear process of reasoning. We are not at liberty to set it aside. We are not at liberty to fudge it, to gloss it over. So clear is reason. But, on the other hand, Imagination must also have her place. And the truth to which imagination bears witness, however apparently contra contrary to the truths made available by reason, must also be taken seriously. Wound not Demeter in her fertile pains, nor rebel against her mother right. And so at the volta or turn of this, uh, what is in fact uh, an extended, a 16 line sonnet, um, Lewis asks the vital question, a question which I think remains still hanging in the air for all of us and for our, our life as a culture and as a nation, I think. Oh, who will reconcile in me? both maid and mother, who make a concord of the depth and height, who make imaginations, dim exploring touch, ever report the same as intellectual sight. There are extraordinary number of beautiful things going on here. From the sense first that this poem gives you, if you think about yourself, of inner space, of height and depth within the psyche itself, to the bodying forth of the soul's distinct powers, uh, reason and imagination, in the form of these two goddesses, Athene and Demeter. And this is no glib classical illusion in the 18th century manner. This is a symbolic reimagination and shaping of the inner self, in which more than personal, perhaps even more than human powers, are at work in shaping to make us, uh, make us what we are as people. And I think it's highly significant um, that we should, at this point, that, that for Lewis, both of these deep powers of the soul, whom he seeks to have reconciled, are figured as feminine. Now, Lewis is sometimes caricatured as a sort of bluff, masculine, conservative, probably misogynistic bachelor don, who didn't sort of get or understand women. And here he is, expressing the heart of his inner life by saying, in effect, my problem is that I can't get my inner goddesses together. That's really what he's saying. So, after Lewis has explored these many paired contrasts, you, you notice it's beautiful, you've got touch versus sight, light, dark, maid, mother, depth, height. The poem ends with that plea, uh, which I think subtly summons echoes of its own answer, that question, who will reconcile 
in me, both maid and mother, who make a concord of the depth and height. Now, from the later perspective of Lewis's conversion, we can see who these lines are pointing to. We can see where they point. We can see that they give a new significance to the paradox of incarnation, which is at the height, heart of the Christian faith, uh, at the heart of the, the faith that Lewis would embrace. For it is, of course, the Christian figure of Mary who in her open yes to God, reconciles and indeed is both maid and mother. And it is in in and through her open yes to God, which is for everyone the archetypal ascent of all faith. Every Christian ultimately in saying yes to God's extraordinary proffer of himself in love given through the Spirit is with that yes of hers. And all of us, in our own way, have to become theotikoi. We have to become God-bearers. There are those, somehow, uh, the word continues to be made flesh through that ascent. So she reconciles both maid and mother. And through that yes, Christ himself, the reconciler, comes into the world. He is the one who not only reconciles man to God, but reconciles time to eternity. He is the one, Christ, who is in himself the concord of all depth and height, of all innerness and outerness. And of course, Lewis's image of who will reconcile in me, that the depth and the height, does itself seem to be carrying an echo, surely, of Paul's language in Ephesians, which is there with Lewis because just the very culture in which he's brought up gives him these resonant scriptures, if only half remembered from dull chapel services at school. They're in there somewhere making part of what, you know, Eliot rightly called the auditory imagination. So he finds himself, even before he can know the Christ who is the these things, already drawing on the language, which in, almost helps to shape and form what is to come. Language he perhaps heard but didn't understand. So he's echoing in this poem, surely, that prayer of Paul's in Ephesians, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. But at that point in that poem, these are, as it were, anticipatory echoes. The poem is still asking the question who. It stands um, as a witness to an impasse. It points to a hoped-for concord which has not yet arrived. Indeed, this poem is itself an example of the way in which the imagination can sometimes body forth for us glimpses of a potential truth which we have not yet come to by reason. It's not simply, as in the examples that that Alistair gave us earlier, that we we see something by reason and then, then we have a wonderful way of sort of showing it. Sometimes we're shown something in a shape before we actually understand rationally the substance of what it is. Um, It's an example, in fact, um, of what Coleridge, whom I want to speak about more, um, called the sacred power of self-intuition. And he alludes to it in an extraordinary passage in in the um, Biographia Literaria, Um, One of the many um, passages where Coleridge, who was very interested in the science of his day and in close observation of nature, draws from his observation of little insects and water beetles and that kind of thing, sudden images that really help you to understand how your mind works. So this is what Coleridge says. He says, they and only they can acquire the philosophic imagination, the sacred power of self-intuition, They who within themselves can interpret and understand the symbol that the wings of the air sylph are forming within the skin of the caterpillar. 
Those only who feel in their own spirits the same instinct which impels the chrysalis of the horned fly to leave room in its involucrum for the antennae yet to come. They know and feel the potential works in them even as the actual works on them. That's you wonderfully dense bit of Coleridge, but just think about that image, that image of the little creature who doesn't yet know what it's going to be, but is somehow able to make, as it were, the outer carapace and shape, leave room and shape for a growth that is yet to come, begin to guess at the outsides of a thing which is yet to be filled from the inside. I think that's a beautiful picture of what the imagination, and particularly what Tolkien and Lewis called the mythopoeic imagination, can do. And I think that is one reason why, when we're reading widely in people's imaginative writing, when we're reading the poets and the, the myth-makers of our own day, we should not in the least concern ourselves with a quick cross-check of their Christian orthodoxy before we get to read their works or not. Some of them may, even as we read their fantasy, be beginning to make the shape of the antenna that they haven't got yet. And they may even be shaping for others the possibility of a Christian realization which will come to others before it comes to them. We should be concerned more with the truth and beauty of the shapes they're making, of their consonance with the true, the good, and the beautiful, wherever we find it from its origin in Christ to its last beautiful manifestation in the smallest fall of a leaf. That should concern us more then, as it were, making sure that they've rationally ticked the boxes yet, that we hope they will eventually uh, uh, perhaps tick. So, um, now, I think in this poem, Reason, Lewis is making the shape which will be fully filled by the coming of Christ into his life. The reconciler is not there yet, but he absolutely delineates every single thing that the reconciler is going to have to do and that the reconciler, in fact, does do for him. Now, the way Lewis found out of this impasse um, witnessed in this poem was at once a spiritual, a theological, and a literary revolution. And it brings us to the heart both of his Christian belief and of his literary practice. Because for Lewis, Christ did indeed reconcile the broken parts and the severed dimensions of our divided being. The height, the depth, the outer, the inner, the reason, the imagination. And that's why, I, uh, much as I deeply admire um, uh, Walter Hooper, and like all of us here, I'm sure, I'm immensely grateful for the work that he's done in presenting and preserving so much of Lewis's work for us. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have to say, I don't think his suggested title of reason for this poem does it justice. I think it may even skew the way we read it. Though equally, to have titled this poem Imagination would do the same. The poem is not about exalting one of these faculties over the other, but about reconciling them. A better title for this poem might simply be Who? The real question posed by the poem is Who is the reconciler? And reading the poem now, it's easy for us to see that the answer is Christ. On the one hand, the story of his death and resurrection summons the deepest imaginative and mythic response in us. But on the other hand, the story of his incarnation brings imaginative myth on the one hand and actual history to be grasped at with the reason on the other together. For Christianity is, as Lewis came to believe, myth made history. As we've seen, the language of the poem with its echo of Ephesians points to a profound and integrative theology of incarnation. But it was not until another five or six years had passed that Lewis was able fully to answer the question posed uh, in this poem. So, that's an example of the process of imaginative anticipation of truths which reason has not yet attained to. And Lewis, in fact, describes that himself more generally in Surprise by Joy in that very beautiful saying of his there, my imagination was, in a certain sense, baptized. <laughs> the rest of me not unnaturally took longer. 
It's not surprising, therefore, that appeals to imagination in all the writing of Lewis are not simply a decorative extra, a sweetening of the doctrinal pill in Lewis's apologetic writing, but, as Alistair McGrath has shown, are woven essentially into the fabric of what he says. The truth of imagination, as Keats called it, is part of the message. And so at this point, I think it's worth asking what Lewis himself meant by imagination. In what tradition is he standing as he speaks of it? And fortunately, we have another poem, a poem addressed to his fellow poet, Roy Campbell, almost totally overlooked by um, uh, Lewis scholars, in which he sets out, Lewis sets out to Roy Campbell, he's rebuking Roy Campbell in the poem for, uh, for using the term romantic as a term of abuse. And he's trying to get him to see that there is, as it were, a philosophically coherent and mature version, as it were, what his great friend and unofficial teacher, Owen Barfield, called Romanticism Come of Age. And he's trying to locate for Roy Campbell what that stream is. Um, and in that account of Romanticism, and specifically the Romanticism that gives us an idea of what the imagination is and can do, Coleridge, uh, whom I've already alluded to, plays a central role. So these are some lines from his poem to Roy Campbell, Lewis's poem to Roy Campbell. In England, the romantic stream flows from Scott, from Coleridge too. Newman, in that ruinous master, saw one who restored our faculty for awe, who rediscovered the soul's depth and height, who pricked with needles of the eternal light and England, at that time half numbed to death with Paley's, Bentham's, Malthus' wintry breath. Let's just have a little look at those, those, those lines, because I think the things that he is pointing to Coleridge having done and Newman having seen Coleridge doing of course, he's appealing to Newman because Roy Campbell is a Catholic and he's trying to show, he's trying to take a great Catholic master to, to, to show uh, that, they're all, that we're all, as it were, singing from the same hymn sheet. So in this poem, you see again the images of depth and height. And you can actually, in this poem, even anticipate, if you wish, the glorious power of an imaginatively refigured Christ in Aslan who frees Anania, half numbed to death, from a white witch's wintry breath. Um, and though, of course, Lewis would have read uh, Coleridge's bi uh, biography, Literaria, uh, as a matter of course, he was fortunate in having as his close friend uh, the wisest and best of his unofficial teachers, Owen Barfield, for whom Coleridge's understanding of imagination was essential for a complete renewal of the way we see the world. Now, in this poem to Roy Campbell, Lewis has already set out the kind of thing imaginative apologetics might be called to do. And let's just look at some of those phrases. I think they're crucial, not only as Lewis's agenda, but as our own agenda, to be frank. Uh, so wh wh what are they? To restore our faculty of awe. To help the soul rediscover its depth and height. And in Lewis's telling and beautiful phrase, to prick with needles of eternal light a benumbed contemporary culture. Isn't that an extraordinary image? And it's almost, there's both the kind of Socratic gadfly doing, but this time the gadfly, in, 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 in the uh, Plato's Apology, of course, the Socratic pricking and gadfly is all done by asking rational questions and by showing up specious reasoning. But that's not the way we're going to do our Socratic gadfly thing now, says, says Lewis. No, 
We are going to prick with needles of eternal light. We're going to prick, we're going to awaken the numbed person by saying, you're yearning for the eternal, you're yearning for a light that's streaming through. And there's almost, for me, an image that's kind of maybe half remembered from Blake about golden threads. Of course, Don B. Griffiths, Lewis's great friend, um, used the golden thread as a, as a, and I wonder if the needles aren't also a kind of sewing, a kind of shooting the dull, kind of benumbed, cloth that's been cast over our world and our culture and just having these little golden threads suddenly come pricking out of it and pulling and, and teasing at us. I think that's the approach that he's taking. So um, I think the most helpful mapping beyond this poem itself of the terrain uh, that Lewis was to body forth and explore in his great fiction in books like the Ransom Trilogy and the Chronicles of Narnia, Until We Have Faces. The great mapping of that is to be found much earlier, and again, in Biographia Literaria, in the programme that Wordsworth and Coleridge had set themselves at the beginning of the Romantic movement, um, as it was later recalled by Coleridge in the Biographia Literaria. And um, this is the famous passage written years later when Coleridge talks about what they thought they were about. It's not the preface, the original preface to, um, uh, to, to, to the um, uh, uh, lyrics, but it's a later thing. Here is what he says. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads, in which it was agreed, this is Coleridge writing, that my endeavours should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Mr. Wordsworth, on the other hand, was to propose to himself as his object to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by, it's a key phrase, awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and wonders of the world before us. An inexhaustible treasure, but for which we, in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. So that's the program that Wordsworth and Coleridge had set themselves. And I think we can see both of those endeavours, as Coleridge calls them, at work in Lewis's best imaginative writing. Certainly, he procures for characters supernatural, at least romantic, just exactly that transference and bodying forth of our inward nature that Coleridge was aiming for. Whether it's the icy white witch, or the golden goodness of Aslan, whether it's the numinous Eldilla in the Ransom Trilogy, or the beautifully embodied figures of Psyche and Oruel until we have faces. He certainly does that Coleridgean part of the program. But in some ways, I think, it's the Wordsworthian more than the Coleridgean side of his achievement which makes Lewis such an effective imaginative apologist. What were the phrases to, that Coleridge wanted to use about that? Well, the power, quote, to, to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by, quote, awakening the mind's attention and directing it to the loveliness and wonders of the world uh, before us. Now, it's often been remarked that it's much easier to portray evil than it is to portray goodness. Uh, Philip Larkin, indeed, was famously asked why he wrote so many depressed and depressing poems. And he, he replied, happiness writes white. By which he meant it's like writing with a white pen on white paper. You know, there's no contrasts. Um, but actually, many people have noted that Lewis is a great exception to that rule. The sheer goodness of his good characters, 
the sense throughout his books of solid joys and lasting treasures, which he evokes certainly in the weight of glory and sustains so beautifully throughout the great divorce. Michael Ward has drawn attention to the extraordinary imaginative skill and intertextual layering with which Lewis built up what he, Lewis, called the Kappa element uh, and his, his inv inv invocation of the, the donigality or unique quiddity, the rich particularity, the inexhaustible wonder of the particular things he celebrates in their various planetary clusters in each of the seven chronicles. There's an attention to the sheer particular goodness of things written about in such a way that you almost see and taste and touch them for the first time. This power of re-enchantment, of removing the film of familiarity, of awakening the mind's attention, is something Lewis was consciously striving for in his writing. He makes this clear in his important essay on three ways of writing for children. And in that essay, Lewis makes a distinction between the kind of fantasy writing that is mere ego-pleasing and this worldly wish fulfillment, of which he says, its fulfillment on the level of imagination is in very truth compensatory. We run to it from the disappointments and humiliations of the real world. It sends us back to the real world undivinely discontented. It is all flattery to the ego. He's talking essentially not only about the kind of children's stories where you get to be captain of the first 11 and all goes well. He's also talking about sex and shopping novels, which he actually summarizes really beautifully later on another thing he just sort of... But he contrasts that with another kind of imaginative writing. Imaginative in the Coleridgean sense of this wo that word. The kind of writing Lewis was aiming for throughout. And of this he says, about evocations of fairyland. It would be much truer to say that fairyland arouses a longing for he knows not what. It stirs, he is the reader here, it stirs and troubles him to his lifelong enrichment with the dim sense of something beyond his reach and far from dulling or emptying the actual world, gives it a new dimension of depth. depth. He does not despise real woods because he has read of enchanted woods. The reading makes all woods a little enchanted. Now that seems to me an absolutely crucial insight and also I should say a proper reply to the various attacks on Lewis in, 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 um, in um, argument as well as in fiction as it were by Philip Pullman. I mean, Pullman has an entirely right uh, sense that we don't want the kind of religion which, as it were, drains this world of all its goodness, which kind of pours out through some, you know, holy portal all the love and care and concern and minute and particular attention that we should be giving to the inexhaustible wonders of our being here. And Lewis, uh, Pullman was persuaded, I think, entirely wrongly, <laughs> that that's what Christianity is. And therefore, you know, what has been opened with a subtle knife must be closed. And, you know, he wants you to be back this worldly. But Lewis is a much more profound thinker. He points it as a paradox. The paradox is that just as you enter the other yearning world, the other enchanted wood, when you return, you return with a new sense of the wonder of what's here. It does not evacuate your world. He famously said it's no good having people who are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly use. But I think he would have approved, although he generally didn't like hymns, he would have approved that line in the hymn that says, that we with our hearts in heaven here on earth may fruitful be. And that sense of being a master not only of the journey out and the enchantment, but a master of, as it were, the re-enchanted and fruitful return is made explicit, I think, actually, in my view, too explicit, in a, a famous passage in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, when Aslan has told Edmund and Lucy that they can't come back to Narnia. You are too old, children, said Aslan, and you must begin to come close to your own world now. Just that sentence blows the entire Pullman thesis out of the water, I have to say. You must begin to come close to your own world now. It isn't Narnia, you know, sobbed Lucy. It's you. We shan't meet you there. 
And how can we live, never meeting you? But you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. Are, are you there too, sir, said Edmund? I am, said Aslan. But there I have another name. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. Now, as I say, Lewis may be in danger of making things too explicit here and breaking his own spell. I think a better emblem of the real imaginative enchantment, the good spell that Lewis achieves, particularly through the art of storytelling itself, is in the little episode in that same book where Lucy finds in the magician's big book a spell for the refreshment of the spirit. You remember how that passage goes. The pictures were fewer here, but very beautiful. And what Lucy found herself reading was more like a story than a spell. It went on for three pages, and before she had read to the bottom of the page, she'd forgotten that she was reading at all. She was living in the story as if it were real, and all the pictures were real too. When she had got to the third page and come to the end, she said, that is the loveliest story I've ever read or ever shall read in my whole life. Now, you remember, part of the magic was that Lucy couldn't turn back the pages of the book and repeat the experience or even remember the story. But when she meets Aslan at the end of this episode, she asks, shall I ever be able to read that story again, the one I couldn't remember? Will you tell it to me, Aslan? Oh, do, do, do. Indeed, yes. I will tell it to you for years and years. Now here, Lewis offers the enchantment of imaginative story as both a bridge between reason and imagination, but also as an emblem of heaven itself. So finally, let's return um, to that poem, Reason, and to the way um, uh, it f finally came to be resolved, the dilemma so fruitfully in Lewis's actual conversion and his subsequent writing. Lewis famously said, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. We cannot have one without the other. And in order to make them work together, we must respect their differences. Lewis never published the poem Reason in his lifetime, but had he been consulted towards the end of his life, he might have wanted, from the perspective of those later works that he wrote, that appeal both to reason and imagination, he might perhaps have challenged his own phrasing at the end of that poem. Particularly the phrase, ever report the same. Who make imagination's dim exploring touch? ever report the same as intellectual sight. In one sense, that phrase would set a false goal and betray a failure of imagination if it implies that the reports given to us by reason on the one hand and imagination on the other should be so exactly the same that each could be translated into the other without loss. But if we mean by report the same, not bring back word for word the same report, but rather report in different ways and from different terrains the same single reality, bring back news in different languages from the same far country, then indeed we will be asking for something which Lewis's mature writing delivers to us in great and generative abundance. And it's that generative abundance that generosity of spirit, that lavish provision of infinitely suggestive image and metaphor, of stories that are mythopoeic, not allegories in themselves, but, as Lewis said of Tolkien, constantly suggestive of incipient allegory, which is the great legacy of Lewis to us. Stories and poetry which not only kindle the imagination for Christ, but constitute in themselves an open door, an invitation to new and yet more generative works of imagination. I'm so glad that Alistair said the same thing at the end of his discourse. We need more of this and we need it new and we need the next generation of Lewis's. So I'd like to conclude these remarks on Lewis and imagination, not 
in literary critical or even in theological mode, I'd like to conclude uh, with imagination and with poetry. And I shall try, therefore, to give scholarship the kiss of life with a verse and sum up everything I really want to say about Lewis on this momentous occasion in a sonnet. Here it is. C.S. Lewis. From Beer and Beowulf to the seven heavens whose music you conduct from sphere to sphere, you are our portal to those hidden havens whence we return to bless our being here. Scribe of the kingdom, keeper of the door which opens onto all we might have lost, ward of a word hoard in the deep heart's core, telling the tale of love from first to last. Generous, capacious, open, free, your wardrobe mind has furnished us with worlds through which to travel, whence we learn to see along the beam and hear at last the heralds sounding their summons through the stars that sing, whose call at sunrise brings us to our king. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Um, questions? Um, please stick your hand up in the air. And uh, just to remind you again, questions for this evening on paper to Dr. Michael Ward, but questions now from the floor to Malcolm. And if you've got a question coming, just stick your hand up and a Virgil will appear with a microphone. Your, your imagery of the, uh, the, the bug, the fly coming out of yeah. the larva was, was a great one. And, well, it's Coleridge is really hard. <laughs> the suggestion that it came out of, well, Coleridge is there. <laughs> and your use of that applying to Lewis and that, that early, what seems to be an early poem. I, I, just really quickly, I think it was Robert Alter talking about the influence of King, the King James's mm. language <laughs> on some of the canonical authors, the novelists, who themselves were wrestling the Melville's and Poe's and so yeah. on with, with the substance of Christianity, but themselves ended up reflecting yeah. perhaps unconsciously some of that in a positive way. And Alter's argument is it's, it's, it's the language itself somehow that does it. It's the Absolutely. rhythms of the language that get into the head. Yeah. Um, I heard you say something like that about what's going on with Lewis. I think Lewis's own upbringing with that was true. I'll tell you, that, that very point which Robert Alter made was made brilliantly just very recently in a really main piece of cultural discourse here in England, um, which was on the Andrew Marr program the other week, where there's a wonderful thing about George Herbert, John Jury's new book, and Jeanette Winterson made the point that having been brought up with the authorised version in her childhood, uh, just made all kinds of imaginative things possible and eventually made us a journey to a more mature faith possible because there was a vocabulary. She went on to say that actually she felt that there was a real loss in the powers and possibilities of expression, unintentionally brought about by highly theoretical educationalists who thought that children shouldn't be exposed to language that they didn't already understand. And saying that's the exact opposite of what education should be. But she made that very point. Um, Fantastic, there's a question over here. If you've got another question here, put your hand up please. That was a beautiful talk, firstly. Thank you, I, I really enjoyed it. At one point, you made a comment that the wisest and best of Lewis's unofficial teachers was Owen Barfield. And I, I wonder that you gave that distinction unequivocally, seemingly, to Barfield, and you didn't seem to consider Tolkien. So I'm just wondering why you would yeah. say that his best teacher was... Oh, oh, I should say that wasn't my judgment. It was Lewis's own. Um, Lewis used that phrase, the wisest and best of my unofficial teachers. <laughs> I think he used it in dedicating um, the allegory of love to, to Owen Barfield. Um, I wouldn't want to judge myself. I mean, I actually think, obviously, Lewis's great essay on friendship, on filia in The Four Loves, talks about first and second friends, and Barfield was the second friend, the one that disagrees with you. 
I actually think Tolkien's friendship to Lewis is just hugely important, not least because I think it's Tolkien who shows Lewis that he can use his full imaginative response to myth and also trust the story of our salvation in Christ as history. And it's that rushing together of those two ideas, perhaps in consequence of their talk on Addison's Walk. So, I mean, if that's a gift that Tolkien gave Lewis in friendship, just that insight that allowed him to finally come to faith, no friend could give any friend a, a more important gift than that. Thank you very much. There's a question here. Um, uh, can we have a copy of your sonnet, please? <laughs> uh, yes, it is, it is in my book, I hasten to add. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's Which in, is available it's at the, the back. <laughs> it's in the singing bowl, but it's also freely available on, on my blog. So, <laughs> so yeah, if, if, should you be pleading poverty, I'm more than happy for you to download it and share it with your friends. But should you want an actual thing in the real world, it's, it's in the singing bowl. <laughs> Very good. Got another question on this side, please. Uh, um, so, what do you think is the role of Jesus Christ in imaginative fiction that is from a source that is non-Christian? Um, and it, would you say that God is present in the kind of fibrility of the human imagination mm. um, that, that is yearning for something that, uh, that is so present in C.S. Lewis's work? Okay, now you could take that question in two different ways about the role of Jesus Christ in imaginative fiction. Obviously, you could talk about actual portrayals of Christ, and that would be a whole thing. Or you could even talk about portrayals of a Christ figure, whether you talk as. But I would like to take it back a stage further. I think I'd want to begin by thinking about that Christ is the Logos, that he is the Word. Um, and to think about him as the light which lightens everyone that comes into the world. And so I'd like to begin by thinking about the way in which the very attempt to make sense and shape of things, to get things, to have nous, to see, as it were, the logos, the coherence in things, is itself something which is God's gift to us in Christ the Word. There's a brilliant little book by St. Augustine called De Magistro, the Teacher, which is much ignored, um, in which he makes the case that at any point where two people are talking, one of them apparently a teacher and the other apparently a student, and a truth is grasped and arrived at, that actually a third person is present who is Christ, whether those people know him or not, that he is the one to whom all things are brought. So I think willy-nilly, just by giving us the capacity and making us in his image, something of the Logos is involved. Now, that something may be corrupted or destroyed or obscured, but it's there. That's the first thing I'd want to say. I think the second thing I'd want to say is that I would be extremely wary myself of um, kind of fictional portrayals of Jesus because I, I have a very high view of, 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 if you like, the discretion of the Holy Scriptures. You know, St. John says that if everything that Jesus had said and did was written down, they wouldn't, the world wouldn't be big enough for all the books. An attractive proposition for a bibliophile like me. But uh, I've got to take it that there's a kind of beautiful restraint, a kind of divine economy in giving us the stories we've got, inviting us to concentrate on those again and again and again. So I think the place for freedom and playfulness in thinking about the Christ figure is not in, as it were, inventing more stories to be attributed to a historical Jesus. I don't think that's a good line to go down. Um, and I think we end up making an idol if we do that. But I think if you take a supposal, as Lewis did, and say, let me take what I know in my own life, the coming of Christ to be like. <laughs> And let me imagine that happening in entirely other circumstances with another name. Then I have a freedom to invent, which, who knows, the same spirit that is there when I'm reading the scriptures might grace in the writing. Thank you. Question at the back. Who would you be pointing us to as the culturally imaginative apologists for young people at the moment who would we will be talking about in 50 years' time? Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I'm not sure I'm really, really kind of qualified to answer that question. I think probably quite a lot of them are probably filmmakers and um, kind of making television programs. I tell you who some of them are, though, are musicians. I think um, 
I once heard somebody describe, you know, music constantly, uh, particularly music on iPlayers, as the kind of amniotic fluid in which the new generation kind of lives and moves and has its being. And I think there are some amazing, I mean, apart from the obvious examples of the sort of U2 kind, I mean, I'm a huge fan of an American band, which I think is much better known in America, but not here, called Over the Rhine, who, who write they very much fulfill, they're a Christian group, but they very much fulfill that Emily Dickinson thing about uh, tell all the truth, but tell it slant, success in circuit lies. And um, they are certainly capable of delivering imaginatively what Dickinson in her beautiful rhyme calls the truth's superb surprise. So it may not be novels, it may be films and music that that the imaginative apologetics will be happening in, or at least will be jostling the soil of the imagination so that it's ready to receive the seed of the word when it's sown. Thank you. Another question on this side. Ah, oh, done. At the back, please. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. My question relates to Sir Rabindranath Tagore. Mm. I wonder if you have any views on whether he had any influence on C.S. Lewis. I'm mindful that he gave some very famous Hibbert lectures at Oxford University in 1930 or 1931. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, Tagore was the author of the Nobel Prize winning poem, Gitanjali. I like Tagore and I, 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 I know him. I'm not aware of an influence on Lewis. I know there's a great kind of Tagore, kind of Yeats connection. And um, of course, Lewis um, deeply admired Yeats showed his Irishness completely by always referring to him as one of our poets. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know about Tagore, but there are many Lewis experts here. So, I mean, I'm looking at Dr. Ward. Anybody? I think Dr. Ward has probably read every word that Lewis has ever written. So, does the name Tagore... But it's amazing how often great minds, you know, don't... I mean, I've just been working on a thing to do with um, uh, Lewis's Abolition of Man, in, during which I wanted to ask what if anything, Lewis thought about Wilfred Owen, both young officers on the Western Front. And there is no reference whatsoever in any of the three huge volumes of Lewis's correspondence to Wilfred Owen. This seems to be extraordinary, but there it is. Just time for one more question. It's over here. How, how is it that Lewis's image of the imagination is that of Demeter, the darkness underground, when the imaginative worlds that he produces are so absolutely lucid? Mm. That's a very, very good question. Mm, and I think it's about the difference between the, the forming process of the artistry and the actual finished thing. Lewis really didn't like confessional poets who invited you deep into the wardrobe of their soul, as it were, and showed you all the grubby bits. He actually thought that the, the kind of generative, formative stuff should go on in the dark with long pains and long delight in order to produce the fruit, the flower, the beautiful thing. So the point about Demeter is that although her pains are long and her delight and she works in the dark, it's in the dark that the seed grows. It's underground that the seed grows. This is a, this is a contrast that George Herbert loved as well. Um, then it can bear fruit in something. So I think that's, that's why it's, it's about the fertility of nurture and wombing and seed sowing. And I think Lewis, Lewis unashamedly and happily saw that as a very feminine aspect of his own life and personality. And, uh, and then it, it gave growth. But I agree with you, of course, that light, as we heard from Dr. is the key leading sign for the yearning things. And Lucy, of course, her name tells you everything you need to know. And she is, as it were, the most spiritually aware figure in, in the whole Lewis oeuvre. Um, but I think he understood that these beautiful things need their time first in a kind of formative, careful, wombing dark that, that doesn't immediately foreclose on their possibilities, but just lets them grow until they're ready to come into the light. Well, Malcolm, that's a great point at which to end. And thank you so much for telling us the truth through imaginative fiction. I have to say, you have brought the inner goddesses in me together. <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> help to reconcile maid and mother. I, I think it's very good. But I think above all, that sense of the capaciousness into mm. which we can grow. Mm. Thank you so much for your contribution. Lots more ahead, but let's give you a grand round of applause. <laughs>